guess it's seven o'clock, so we can open tonight's meeting. Um, meeting of Waterbury Select Board, Tuesday, September 14th, 2021. Uh, our Zoom is working, is it, Karen? Uh, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Mark's not here tonight, so I'll be kind of running the meeting. Um, first thing on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Make sure any add-ons or changes? Can I, in um, addition, just an update on the um, Ice Center last meeting? Sure. I've got a couple changes, two clips. Okay. Um, changes there. So we put. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to recommend that we take off the review of the entertainment moments tonight since Mark was one of the ones that. We want to talk about it. I think we might as well reschedule that. So, All right. so can we swap it? Yes. Yep. And then um, <clears throat> I have, so that would be me. So, F, uh, consider vacancies on other town elected commissions. And then um, G would be. Um, Consider a proposed re uh, resolution of a uh, court case. So, okay. If there's nothing else, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda, please. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda items consist of the minutes of August 23rd meeting. And uh, yeah, I screwed up uh, this letter B. I didn't realize that Carla had that under, I didn't look to see that she had it under consent agenda. So um, letter B, if you're going to do it under consent agenda, is to appoint William Sheplak as voting delegate to the LCT Town Fair. The reason I took my name out when I saw it there was because it's the board's prerogative to appoint who you want. You don't have to appoint it. So I didn't realize it was on the consent agenda. So. Okay, so and I'll ask the board if they want to discuss that under uh, <clears throat> regular business or just leave it as the consent agenda item with, with uh, the fact that Bill would be the appointee for the voting delegate. Because if we leave it on consent agenda, we don't do a separate motion and yeah, I think we just get approved. I think it'd be better to put it on the manager's item. So we'll, well put it on the select board. I yes. guess yes. Yeah, which is F of oh, G, I guess it would be. Uh, you've got G in the court case, it's G, right? Yeah. Well, no, 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 H. 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 Yeah. All right. So we'll do that. So, okay. <laughs> so we deleted that out of the consent agenda item. So the only thing for the consent agenda is the minutes of August 23rd. Easy peasy. Make a motion to approve. Yep. So, all right. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Public. Is there anybody? From the public that wishes to speak now, just anything, you're all welcome to participate in questions uh, as the agenda goes on. As far as long as it's uh, limited comments. And I see no one here wants to speak to the public, so we will move forward. Uh, Waterbury Land Initiative, Steve and Sagenbach. What's that? That's not bad. I'm Jason. Um, okay. I guess. Sure. Come on, set. Come on, man. <clears throat> well, B, everyone, um, appreciate the opportunity to come here and uh, and share with you some information about the Waterbury Land Initiative. So um, I'm Steve Hagenbu. I'm the chair. Of the Water Gray Land Initiative. And really, when I asked to be um, put onto an agenda, it was really to be uh, provide information 
to all of you. Um, I'll let you know right up front, I'm not here with any particular ask of the select board um, or the, the municipality, um, but really just to be give information, let you know who we are, um, what it is we're up to, and um, think that there may be opportunities in the future for us to be a resource um, for the town and when it comes to implementing certain parts of the, the town plan. Uh, so um, with that, I'll kind of jump right into things. So we're just a, we're a very small uh, grassroots local volunteer nonprofit. You know, we were established two years ago, um, really came, came about by a number of us parents who at the time had kids playing soccer in town and we get together and we talk about things that we we really liked about Waterbury. We come to this kind of common understanding and, and agreement that we all tend to want to live here um, in part due to the, the natural environment that Waterbury offers, whether it be the forest land, the open agricultural land, the, the, just kind of the pastoral setting, the forest setting that this town provides um, is something that we all know draws people here. And at the same time, um, it can be something that um, has the potential to, to kind of threaten that landscape um, with the opportunity for you know, more people wanting to come here to experience that um, it has potential to, to start to take away some of that open land and some of that open space. And so it was a need that we identified um, that we wanted to be uh, come together as a group to really be a resource um, to help people that were interested in the long term conservation of their land. And we started, started talking with people. And we started to hear from individuals who said, you know, that, that's something that I've often thought about doing. It's something I'd like to do, but I don't know how to. I don't know what, what's involved in it. Or I have approached um, a land trust, maybe the Vermont Land Trust or even the Snow Land Trust, and for, for various reasons, um, their property didn't really hit the marks of the priorities for those organizations. And so we saw that there was a bit of a, a lack in opportunities for people um, whose property didn't necessarily fit the, the the strategic plans and goals of some of the other conservation organizations that come into play. So with that, um, we did, like I said, two years ago, we kind of established ourselves as a nonprofit here in the state of Vermont. Um, and, and really, um, we want to be able to assist, like, like I said, those landowners who voluntarily want to conserve their land. So we're not actively going out and looking for, for places that we think should be permanently conserved and protected. In, in any way. Um, it's really listening to the community, hearing what they have to say and seeking hear where their interests are um, and helping those individual um, property owners to, to meet that, that goal that they have. Um, when it comes to the town plan, um, you know, I, I give kudos to the town for um, acknowledging in the last uh, rendition of the plan, things like the highest priority interior forest blocks and really recognizing the importance of our um, recreational assets in, in terms of the economic development of the town. Um, those are all things that we think that within our mission um, are things that we can help out with. And I wanted to just, I'm going to read it right off the paper so I don't miss anything, um, what the mission of the Water Great Land Initiative is. Uh, it is to lead, support, and assist in the conservation of Waterbury and Waterbury area land in order to protect and improve Waterbury's outdoor recreation, agricultural, cultural, wildlife habitat, and water resources in a manner that will support and enhance the social and economic vitality of Waterbury while maintaining ecological functions. So we do recognize that there, you know, we're, we're not, they said we're not anti-development, but we want to, to be um, helping to think about smart growth, smart development, and where the best places for some of that to be. And for those landowners interested in protecting the land, we want to be that, um, that resource that can help facilitate that. So we are not a land trust in our own right. So um, by that, I mean, I don't know how familiar folks are with, with kind of the mechanics of land conservation, um, but one of the, the common things you hear about are conservation easements that place a deep restriction on a property that allows certain activities while prohibiting other activities. Um, and we are not uh, currently set up to, to be that sort of an organization. So we wanna work with others that have that capacity, um, but we're also looking at other opportunities for um, helping people realize those objectives in conservation as well. I also wanted to, to just to kind of put a, a point on the, the fact that, that there are people interested and you're hearing from, there's a project that we're working on right now. It is by no means um, a finalized project um, to mean that it's going to absolutely happen, but it's located on Perry Hill Road and the landowners, um, based on the, the, the position of the property, which adjoins the C.C. Putnam State Forest, um, there's a real opportunity and interest 
um, from a lot of partners are working with to have that be included as an addition to the CC Putnam State Forest and to enhance the, the current mountain bike trail system that's there um, and provide additional recreational opportunities um, for the community off of that. So that's something we've worked, we're working on for about a year and a half now. Um, conservation takes a long time. We have we have been working with WADA, we've been working with um, the Vermont and Stowe Land Trust uh, kind of as, as helping guide us in the process. Um, and we've been talk, starting to talk to some potential um, funders to help to see that project um, be realized as well. Um, and we're always looking for, you know, providing that service to, to other people who would be interested in, in doing similar sorts of things. So um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause and I'll certainly entertain any, any questions or, or, or comments that people have to understand more about what we do. You said I was on Zoom. Yeah. Um, you said that you know you're not a land trust in the sense that it's at this time. So is that right. a goal for you all? Um, it's something. So one of the things that we're doing as an organization is um, looking at a strategic planning process, and, and that'll be one of the questions we'll be asking: is whether we want to be have the, the capacity to the ability to be one of those easement holders. Um, because we kind of see ourselves as fit, filling a niche that that may be currently a void, which is where you know, smaller parcels, where those other land trusts wouldn't be interested um, in when easements on, that may be something that we would need to do in order to, to help facilitate that. Steve, yeah, Mike. One good seeing you again. Yeah. Um, one big question I have, and this is just from what your description, is it sounds like these are activities folks could already take advantage of. You're just really, but kind of a nonprofit consultant for them. Would that yeah, be a correct statement? Absolutely. Um, uh, I think that's a fair characterization. You know, again, there could be some properties that uh, a, a current land trust would be willing to to have discussion right. about, but the landowner doesn't know um, what those opportunities are or how to to, right. to get there. So in that case, we may just be a kind of a facilitator, a conduit to make that communication happen. Kind of like years ago on the conservation commission where we talked about. If we had a good conservation project working with the Stowe Land Trust, because not kind of recreating the wheel of the whole thing right. in Waterbury and using their facility. And of course, they would have some fees and stuff like that associated. But I think that's, yeah. you know, there are good mechanisms here. There are to me a lot of land conservation groups already. And you hate to see yeah. they're kind of in, in con conflicting. Right, right. You know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and I actually thanks Mike for bringing that up. So there is, I want to make the distinction between the Waterbury Conservation Commission, which I also serve on, um, and the Waterbury Land Initiative. They're two distinct organizations um, with, with different functions, one being municipal board um, or commission, and the other being a private nonprofit non organization. So you have your 501c3 status in the whole round. So we are a registered nonprofit. We are not a 501c3 at this time. Okay. So we're actually been working with RW as our fiscal sponsor, so that when we do um, go forward to you know to write some grants for something which we haven't done, well actually we have we have applied to Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for um, for some funds to get some appraisals done. So you guys were registered with the Secretary of State as an organization, right? Yeah, and we're in the process of looking at that right now. Okay, thanks. And how can we and members of the town stay up to date on what they're working on and after projects and things yeah. like that? Yeah, so we don't, um, because we are still, we're very young, um, we are all volunteer, but we, we haven't yet established a, a website or any kind of other means of communication. We don't have a membership um, at this time. And so the best way for us to kind of keep, keep um, the select board involved would be with some periodic updates, email updates of projects that are happening. Um, certainly as we move forward and we start to have some projects really come in the pipeline, like Phil, we're working on, then I think at that point, we'll be looking more at things like a, um, maybe some updates on Home Porch Forum or, um, or, or developing a website so that people can see. And I'd be happy to provide any updates to any, anyone here um, if that's something you'd like. So, Steve, is uh, one of the components that really lacks in any land preservation efforts obviously is by the money yeah yeah uh, and i've been in the construction industry all my working career and uh i've seen born and raised here i've seen 
pendulum swing amount of land open versus not open now mm -hmm. uh, and being developed and I'm part of that problem uh, and I recognize that and it it has an impact on me mentally um, because every time I do a project I think to myself there goes another piece of the lawn I, I know I know people here have heard it before, but I've always, you know, I play the Powerball from time to time, and I always swore that if I ever won the big one, um, that I would reverse the development trend if I could in the town of Waterbury uh, and aim it more towards your effort of more preservation and less development. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, and I said it before. You know, we're going to miss not having scenes like that uh, in the open landscape. Uh, it would just be a picture that we're looking at instead. Um, so I applaud your efforts. Um, I would like to think and hope at some point that uh, maybe if there are people out there that feel the way you do and the way I do, that they could start ponying up, uh, you know, some yeah. finances to uh, start putting putting more teeth in your effort. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and, and I, there will be opportunities certainly as we you know move some of these projects forward to um, you know, acquisition phases, if that's what it is, or or purchase, purchasing of a conservation easement. Um, there will always be a, a, a public component. That, that people can contribute to that. And so there'd be a variety of sources we would look to for funding, um, but always the, the individual community members having an opportunity to contribute to that would be something that, that will be there. Yeah, of course, since the COVID, real estate prices have skyrocketed. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's made it more difficult for you to gain any ground in your efforts. Yeah, um, and there are, you know, there are, the appraisals there's conservation appraisals and then there's uh, development appraisals and so um kind of the difference between <laughs> those are really what we're looking at um and uh but uh, but you're right there's it's 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 both a it's a good time to be thinking about land conservation because of the, the interest for people to be coming here um due to COVID and even before that and at the same time that does put um the cost of those those places um, very high. Good. Yes. So thanks, Steve, for coming in. Um, and I guess I'll acknowledge first that there's open land and there's open land. And it's as, as probably the first person that people call about taxes being too high. Um, I got to ask. In a town where we have 40% of our land area that is either in the Mountain Mansfield State Forest or the Putnam State Forest, yeah. how much more state forest do we really need? Yeah. Um, saving things like that, you know, you go up into the reservoir and up into the Mountain Mansfield State Forest, it's forest land. It doesn't look like that. The pastoral scenes, you know, the wooded farm or, or the Davis farm, what have you. Um, so I understand there's a, maybe a need to save and keep some of that kind of stuff open, but um, I, I guess I'm a little concerned when I hear that we're trying to add more land to the Putnam State Forest. There's there's a lot of acreage in State Forest in this town already, and is that what we really need? Yeah, uh, because every everything that ends up getting either Put into the state forest, uh, you know, the state's hands. Um, you know, we get a we get a fraction of our tax bill on that from either uh, the pilot program for state forest land. Uh, we have a number of people already who, even though we only have uh, <coughs> two working farms in town now, we have people that have land in current use. A lot of it is forest land that's managed for, for forestry. So I just want that side of the coin to be heard, I guess, yeah. or to be looked at, that um, you know, we need money for a lot of things. We need money to maybe preserve open land, but 
we need a tax base to run the community as well. And there's some plans to build there and us. So I, and I appreciate that, and, and it is a, a conversation that we have. Um, yeah. and we're aware of that that fact. Um, my understanding, and Bill, you would know better than I would, <laughs> that the land going into state ownership, private land going into state ownership, the, the state does provide payments in lieu of taxes. But as you referred to, they're not they're not at the same rate necessarily as the taxes are. But but there is some there is a compensation be. Um, if, I'm, if I understand correctly. Right, but for instance, the uh, I don't have the budget right in front of me, but um, you know, from the pilot payment that we get from um, from the forest land, so we we get we get three three payments from the state to help with open land. First is the current use program, which. Um, Private individuals own property. They agree to keep their land, and you know it's a working landscape. And there's a reduction, so we we get about I don't know. I want to say maybe ninety ninety five thousand dollars from that uh, fund. And then we have <coughs> payment in taxes for the state buildings, primarily the state complex down here, and uh, you know we get three hundred. Fifty thousand dollars from that payment with taxes from the state, and if that was in private ownership, would would probably get eight hundred thousand dollars. So taxation on the same property, um, and then we have the land that's in the Putnam State Forest, in the Mount Mansfield State Forest, which, as I said, is about forty percent of the land area of the town, and we get about one hundred five thousand dollars. So. Hundred and five thousand is a lot better than nothing, <laughs> but it's it's nothing compared to the fair market value of that property. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, you know, we're we're trying to help people who are interested in doing that. And in this 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 example I gave, um, the landowners are interested in having that. If they want to maintain a legacy, a family legacy by not having that <laughs> land be, be developed and having it be in addition to the state forest is is really what we came to together is, is really the best mechanism in that situation to do so. Um, so we want to help people who have that interest to, to, to realize that. Um, understanding, of course, that there's there's always going to be a financial aspect to it. At the same time, we're also seeing that that, that parcel in particular is part of the um, highest priority interior forest blocks and, and the, the need to kind of recognize that and, and to make efforts to protect those areas. Um, as identified yeah, the and, and that certainly if that is the case that's a that's a reasonable thing to consider I guess and um, um you know Dan Sweet isn't here he's our assessor um you know there are conversations that can be had you know from the perspective from the town's perspective would it be better to turn the property over to the state put it in the state forest we'll get some you know, cents on the dollar payment from the state on that. Um, if people, as I understand it, if people sell or give their development rights to a land trust, then they remain the owners of the property. There's still a tax bill. It's a diminished tax bill because the highest <laughs> and best use of that land is land, mm -hmm. open land or whatever it is, as right. opposed to, you know, some kind of development. So. I just want, I just needed to say that. I'm not, I'm not yeah. against preserving open land, certainly. And I'm, you know, I'm well aware that a lot of people come here to live and to play, to, to see things like that. But I just want to make sure that I earn my pay, that, you know, I've got to look out for the finances of the town. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we started with, with nine of the original uh, board members, and now um, we're currently at 11. Um, and we are bylaws allow for 12. We have a, another person that's interested. So there's, there is a lot of these are all Waterbury residents um, that are part of it. And um, it's been exciting to hear how many people are get excited when they hear that, that we exist and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the uh, response of, of folks 
and even in talking to some of the neighbors of the parcel, I think you're referring to people seem very, um, very supportive of the idea um, that we present to them. So, so how does one become a member of the organization? So, so as I, yeah, as I mentioned, we don't have a membership right now. So we are we're a board um, is our membership really, which is not so. Uh, but we that'll be part of our strategic plan as well, which is to say, should we become a membership organization? Um, and we'll address that when, when the time comes. See, what interests me about your idea here, your effort, is uh, I've got 30 acres there, just as you get on the Duffel Road. Um, I'd like to see that property stay as it is, because I keep my field open. Uh, and I constantly in the woods working to enhance the wildlife, uh, you know, ability. Um, I did speak to somebody from Forest and Parks there on the radio one day, and I was explaining to them where I lived and what my property was, and she uh, equated it to uh, the same thing as the uh, Shootsville Hill wildlife corridor and in all right <coughs> areas, I'm, you would be surprised now that wildlife comes through there constantly uh, she asked me if i would consider you know getting onto one of these programs and i just simply told her that i'm the type of person that doesn't want to that money's got to come from other sources other people and i can't conscientiously Take from my neighbors to support my tax bill for my property because I bought the property knowing that there would be taxes that come with it. Uh, but as time goes on, the taxes are starting to really be painful. And uh, I don't want to chop it up uh, and put houses on it and liquidate myself out of it. Uh, and I don't want to have to be forced to leave because I can't afford the property taxes. Um, so I've been starting to talk and consider some of these alternatives as much as I hate to. Uh, and I certainly don't want to, you know, if you, if you put your property into land use, you have to abide by certain guidelines put forward by the state, correct? Right? That's the other thing that, you know, I cut and bail my fields, uh, I'm constantly upgrading the soils to create a better hay uh, for you know for not only my use but selling to other people and uh, uh, and then what forest land I do have around it you know I'm constantly pruning the the wild apple trees so that they bear more fruit for the deer and the other animals and keeping things cut back where I think they need to be cut back and um, just helping provide a better area for the wildlife. Um, I don't feel like I want to be put under the state's thumb. Uh, that's the other reason I've kept from signing up for any of these, you know, subsidies. Yeah, well, that, uh, the current use, and I, I know uh, you have a full agenda, so I don't right. take much more of your time, but um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Programs are um, <clears throat> sometimes misinterpreted of what you must do, um, and uh, they really can be, be beneficial to a lot of landowners. So happy to, to share my perspective on that at another time, if you, if you like. But um, again, I, I, I thank you all for letting me share a bit about us here tonight, and um, I look forward to, to sharing more with you um, with some other projects and further along the pipeline. Well, good luck. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we'll move on. Select board business. Uh, first thing is to uh, interview and consider uh, planning commission nomination of the assistant planning and zoning director. And so, um, Chairman, come on up and sit at that. All right, Chair. Just for the benefit of the select board members who are new or maybe need a refresher course, um, the zoning administrator's position 
is the only position in the town where there's a municipal manager that the municipal manager doesn't hire that employee. Um, a couple of meetings ago, uh, you uh, agreed to uh, new job descriptions for the, um, the planning and zoning director, which will be Steve's title, and then uh, the assistant planning and zoning director. Uh, because the zoning director is part of both of those titles, uh, the attorneys have told us that uh, these positions have to go through the same process as a traditional zoning administrator has to go through in order to be appointed. So, uh, Dina Bookmeyer Baker, who has been our zoning administrator since 2014, I think, uh, retired uh, in <clears throat> July. And we thought we uh, advertised for the position. And uh, the planning commission has now uh, reviewed those uh, applications and they interviewed candidates. And Cameron McCormick, who's sitting here before you now, is the um, person who the planning commission is nominating to the select board for appointment to this position. The select board's role is to interview the candidate if you'd like and then uh, make a decision as to whether you will make an appointment or not. Um, you can't say, well, we don't want Cameron, we want Jeff Larkin. You have to consider the planning commission's nomination. So the planning commission has nominated Cameron uh, for this position. And now it's your turn to interview him. Uh, you can make the interview as long or as short, or as easy or complicated as you would like. And then after he's done at some point tonight or at your next meeting, you can deliberate and make a decision. So um, I'll tell you right now that letter B is to consider the appointment of the planning and zoning director <laughs> by the planning commission. That we hope will be Steve Watts' speech. The planning commission made the appointment of or the nomination of the assistant at the last meeting two weeks ago. Uh, the nomination of Steve for this new position was on the planning commission's agenda last night, but they didn't have a quorum that couldn't meet. So we'll have to we'll have to do this with Steve, Steve's position at a future meeting. So we won't be. Able to so we'll be scratching that. So off. you will not do B tonight, right? We'll take B off. So you're going to interview Cameron, and then you can consider the appointment of uh, <coughs> the person who's been nominated by the planning commission after your interview. And you can do that immediately. You can say that you let it be immediately. You can say, you know, think about it for two months. It's up to you. So anyway, Cameron's here. And uh, one last thing, I, <clears throat> I met with Cameron and Steve yesterday, um, and we do have a policy in town that employees have to be subject to a uh, background investigation before they can be, um, before they can start. So I explained to Cameron that tonight, if the select board chooses to make the appointment that the appointment will be made subject to a successful completion of background investigation. And if you do that, then probably tomorrow I'll get paperwork to him to sign it. And um, the background investigation will take place. It takes usually a week to 10 days or so before we get that back. Well, yes, sir. Not that Cameron's not a fine candidate, I'm sure he probably, probably is, but. We don't get any information about you know other candidates, what their qualifications and well the planning you don't get that because wow. the planning commission they have invented that out and they said it's one person. Okay. So you don't need to know anything about anybody else. Okay. So this is formality through like the state laws yeah. of how the procedure goes. Cam or Cameron? Either works. Cam or Danny. Nice to meet you. I'm about to talk to you like you're not about you like you're not in the room. Okay. <laughs> so the planning commission did a full interview and vetted other candidates, and then also Cam did an interview with you and Steve. 
Well, Ken didn't really do an interview with me. I, okay. mean, I had a meeting with Ken to explain, okay, the planning commission has nominated you. Now this is what happens next. And if your if your select board makes the appointment, here's the parameters of what the job offer is going to be. So he, he pretty much knows what the administrative portion of the job offer is, but I can't officially make that up until we make it a point. Are there any glaring holes that we might need to cover as a board versus like doing a whole interview again? I think or you should just talk yeah. to me. <laughs> I was just curious. Yeah. You tell us about your qualifications and why, why you deserve our approval. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I apologize. I thought perhaps Steve had sent uh, Cameron's resume to you. Right, I was. Uh, you know, Steve wasn't here last week, so I apologize for that. But go ahead. Uh, in May of 2020, I obtained my bachelor's degree in renewable energies from uh, Vermont Technical College. Over the next year, I was working as a project coordinator and warehouse coordinator for Freetown Solar. Uh, wasn't loving what I was doing, and so I started looking around for other passions. I found this position, and uh, I spent a lot of time in customer service throughout school, did a lot of serving, bartending, all of that to pay my way to college. Um, and so uh, public servant seems like a good application of the skills that I've obtained, and uh, I already have the passion for the environment, so planning zoning helps, you know, do what I can to protect the lens that I'd be overseeing. You didn't go directly from high school to UNC, no. right? So. No, I originally went to UNH out of college, out of high school. Uh, being 18 to 20, I was not ready for college, so I left, worked uh, as a drafter for a couple of years, and decided to go back to school. So I went to Massasoit Community College for the mass transfer program, but then ended up moving to Vermont. So I took another year off of school so that I could receive in-state tuition here. And then went did three years at Vermont Tech in the renewable energy program. I originally started as electrical engineering um, with the idea of working with renewable energies. And then when I moved here, I found out about Vermont Tech and its renewable energy program. So <coughs> that was the spot for me. You, I know, I have some planning background. Did you, did you have a significant amount of coursework in planning and that kind of? I had most of my coursework was in you know sciences, engineering, and architecture. So I have some base level. Uh, I, I I have the idea, but I don't do not have any prior experience. Now. So, Cameron, they say that uh, being a select board member is one of the most thankless jobs out there. Um, <laughs> I think that maybe a zoning administrator or planner, uh, town planner, can almost fit in that same category uh, because a lot of times you're dealing with <clears throat> people's uh, uh, personal properties and, and what they feel their rights are to do what they would like to do on those properties and also with their personal financing, you know, finances, because uh, in some cases they can have a lot of money invested in, in the planning process. Uh, and at times uh, people can be perhaps unreasonable. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and confrontational. Um, and are you aware of those issues and ready to take them on? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, I would say my time in restaurants also prepared me for that. I've dealt with my fair share of difficult customers. I've had to cut people off at a bar, um, even had to call in police sometimes to have people escorted out when necessary. Um, i pretty level-headed as a person. I don't take offense too much, so someone's directing anger at me, that's that's fine. I, that rolls off my shoulders and I can move on from there. What is your 
legal trading and your background. I guess I'm going to see that as a little bit of a hole. Uh, I'm so I know I will have to know the uh, all the information for you know the word for now. Um, yeah, all the regulations. I spent a lot of time re reading through different towns uh, statutes for land use while I was at Green Mountain Solar because I was in charge of all the permitting for solar arrays. So I'm pretty used to at least the legal jargon involved in there and the processes of permitting, which I know will be a large part of my position. Another task will be uh, expected, I think, to probably uh, endure is, uh, I guess, defining all the rules and regulations and uh, you know, no matter how hard the planning commission tries there's always gray areas and uh, that may be some other hurdles you'll have, have to overcome at times sounds like you have the passion to want to get involved in it so yeah and knowing that i would have steve as a uh partner and someone to refer to for those gray areas and ask like what would we normally do in a situation like this uh having that source of long-standing knowledge in the position um i think on would be set up for success within there along the lines of what Chris was saying i think not just with says of the town but particularly i think there's a lot of mystery around zoning and people don't understand the process and doesn't feel clear so one of the hopes i have with the restructuring is more easily accessible information about the process breaking it down making it easier to, to find and understand and to be like actually personally accessible to folks is that something that you've talked about and thought about yeah i mean i found myself uh considered for a long time to be a teacher i've always felt it I had a skill for translating things to people so that they could understand them. I spent a lot of my high school time in math teaching the students around me how to do math if they weren't getting it from the teacher. Um, so I think I could use those skills to be able to translate what I know to the public as needed. Are you currently living in Waterbury or near? I am currently in Essex Junction. And my follow-up is, it sounds like you've had a lot of transition in your early life. If, if you did get this role and, and do you see yourself staying here for a while and being a part of our zoning, you know, the job forte in our community for a long term? Yeah, if I was offered the position, that would absolutely be the plan. Um, I've been looking at properties for rent in Waterbury for a significant period of time. <laughs> uh, my partner works in Middlesex. We were living in Montpelier until uh, COVID, we moved up to Essex um, because that's what was available that was suited our needs at the time. But uh, we're definitely trying to move back this way and Waterbury is always in a discussion. So it would be a perfect opportunity. What is your long-term vision for our community? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, keeping it, uh, I would like to maintain the, the beauty, but also have the functionality that the lens offered. Um, I guess controlled growth would be a good term for it. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's a reasonable philosophical question, but you know better than anybody on the board, Mike, that the zoning administrator is not really the, the, the visionary for what the community is going to look like. Totally understand. He's the person that just looks at the regulations and says right. yes or no. But, uh, that was my earlier questions were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, also, for Danny's benefit, maybe, and perhaps Katie, um, the zoning administrator is appointed for a term, it's a three year term. So, to the question about you know what what's your goal how long do you plan to be here 
if he gets appointed and makes it three years, then whoever's sitting on the select board three years from now has a chance to decide whether he's here or not. And that's indefinite, three-year term? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's just it's, how it goes. Yeah, yeah. The zoning administrator, unless Watery someday adopts a charter, right, right. um, the, the state law, state law uh, says the zoning administrator is get appointed for three years. Anybody else have any questions beyond that? Anyone else have? So I think that if uh, everybody's satisfied, then the board agrees to uh, to <coughs> mirror the the uh, planning commission's nomination. So Cameron, what did you say your last name was? McCormick. McCormick. Uh, somebody would like to make a motion to. Uh, Nominate him as an assistant planning and zoning director. Chris? Yeah. I personally would like to discuss this in an executive session. I think it's way more appropriate than just kind of doing it just by voice vote. Yeah. You know, so people, what people's opinions and stuff like that. But, you know, and I don't think it's appropriate with Cameron, you know, you know, pro or con, you know, I think it's something that, you know, you know, we should air that. And maybe that should be put to the end of the meeting. Okay. okay. I'm That's what we do. That's why I asked if apparently if the board was, you know, okay. So, good. But you have a concern, so we'll we'll put that into an executive session at the end of the meeting and, and we'll let you know. All right. You're welcome to stay, but how will you like to go home? And <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, we'll all. Yeah, thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to skip B. And uh, so we're at C, right? C, 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 C. So now we're down to uh, D, which is considering allocating the right. use of an on street parking space for new use at 19 South Main Street. Yeah. So, again, um, <coughs> this is. Steve's not here this evening. He's got a regional planning commission meeting that he's chairing. Um, so Jeff Wackett, I believe, is here as the owner of the building at Land South Main Street. This is for <coughs> space where Garfield's previous uh, lawn used to be. It's actually got a front door on Elm Street. Um, and uh, the applicants, I'm, I assume, maybe you. Want to introduce yourself? I don't know your name. Sure. Um, I'm Janina Kazilis. I own Red Poppy Bakery, which is currently in Burlington, um, but I'll be moving the business down here. Well, um, very soon. I moved to Water myself personally last year. And then just about to die. <laughs> so um, the permit application has been filed. It's been through the zoning process. Uh, it's been to the DRB. Uh, the DRB has approved the use of the space, um, but the DRB had one condition, and this is anachronistic to the village uh, and the current zoning bylaws, even in the downtown district. When when uh, we adopted those interim bylaws we talked about when we were going to deal with the on street parking issue but we didn't so the old uh, bylaw is basically still in effect so this uh, this uh, business does not have the requisite number of off street parking spaces so the drb uh, approved the uh, application and, and uh, approve the permit with the condition that the owner shall obtain approval from the water select board for use of four additional on-street parking spaces to meet the requirement for the building including the change of use for 1,000 square feet on the first floor prior to the issuance of the zoning permit so that's really why they're here tonight um, and as has been joked about often, uh, the on street parking spaces, if everybody who was told that they can use them 
and their customers parking there at the same time would probably can be shown. They can park um, in St. Albans. Yeah. So anyway, I, the recommendation from staff is to uh, allow this, uh, to allow them, and uh, you know make a motion to allocate the use of four additional on-street spaces to meet the parking requirement for the building located at 19 South Main Street, including the use of 1,000 square feet on the first floor from a hair salon, uh, change of use from a hair salon to a retail bakery and specialty school for bread and coffee cakery. So somebody wants to make that motion, then you can second it and then ask questions about it if you want. Uh, so moved. I was going to say, that's a lot of work yeah. to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> you could paint your parking spot, like paint for somebody to take. For Bobby, so you want to like allocate things and you made the motion. Can I, can I, yeah. is there no way to add visual spaces at all? Not really. I and mean, there's there's an alley that was between that, that building and craft beer somewhere, but there's a right away also. It goes through there. Because you know, we joked about, you know, a long time ago, you know, yeah, we would say we allocate, you know, parking spaces 29 dollars. So. Yeah, I mean, as, as a former chair of the RD for 20 plus years, um, that that particular rule, the regulation, and we've had, we've had this conversation in the RD meetings with the RD dozens of times. I strongly, and a lot of the board members will be very strongly feel that that should be stricken out of it. The downtown area that rule because it's uh it, it's really not great for economic development by, by requiring it it's not fair to all that's my personal it's untenable true right and, and and so you're, go ahead. i was gonna say perspective so prohibition big building the building we're talking about tonight and the red four building there's approximately 190 on street parking spaces already permitted to give you a kind of perspective um, the volume of what that has been already issued just for those three buildings right but but in reality it doesn't really cause any problem no not people six out happy yeah. to, to have had it yeah. and just to remind the board i mean there was discussion when we adopted the interim bylaws to recognize the fact that many municipalities are moving away from any parking requirements in the downtown just let people figure it out I mean, it's downtown we want high density we want people walking and and that's the easiest way to get it and if you if you require people to build all these parking lots then you're going to have a whole bunch of parking lots and a lot less places to go so True. it's really uh you know if you look at it from a uh, 21st century land use perspective you want your your lots filled with buildings and people and let them figure out how to get and i'm not even sure the formulas are all that accurate today because people are biking they're walking they're, they're, you know, i'm not sure you know, how you get to the number right. is actually the reality of what's happening and when i asked steve about it today he said that the the new unified bylaws that the planning commission is working on right now with downtown doesn't have the parking requirements. So we haven't adopted that yet, and there's still yeah. requirements. So right now, we still have to consider this motion. Is there a way to make an amendment to the motion that we not allocate parking spaces, but really? Realizing the economic development impacts that we think those spaces, extra spaces need to be allocated. So, so just to be genuine about the thing, not, not to just put yeah, formal well, spaces. I understand, Mike. I think without having the benefit of the bylaws, right. I, mean, I think sticking to the script and doing what the CIB asked you to do is really the same no thing no right doubt. now. I, I agree with Phil. I think because of the way the rules are written, yeah. 
we have to have those four spaces to fit the current rules, right? Even though it may not be reality. But. So, did we ever do a, a full head count on the number of spaces lost because of the reconstruction project? Oh, we did, but I don't know what else going on. No, I mean, lost. <laughs> oh, yeah, lost. Um, you know, that, that, that was kind of always an issue with me about the parking because of you know, some of the complaints about parking. Um, but I've come to the realization that if anybody wants is willing to take the risk to come into the village to start a business, uh, it's kind of a scenario of the strongest will survive, you know, in a sense. Um, if you're willing to put the effort in to create a business, um, and as more businesses come in, they <laughs> compete more for those parking spaces. And, and uh, I guess it's a, I won't call it a crapshoot, but kind of in a sense, a crapshoot whether or not the, the business will be visited by enough patrons to, to, to be successful. And that's that gamble is strictly on the business owner. So I'm completely satisfied with. Um, their choice to do so. So, as far as I'm concerned, if uh, the parking situation, be it as it may, um, I wish you all the success in the world. So, just for the board's benefit, it's a it's a retail bakery, but it also is a school, right? I mean, yeah. and I think part of the reason for the parking shortage if you will is the is the school aspect of it so maybe you just yeah. want to share with yeah. the board what your whole business model is sure so the idea of the business is that it'll have a commercial kitchen and then have a teaching and event space for birthday parties workshops for cake decorating other baking related workshops um, so my hours should be very different from what the rest of my street looks like which gets busier at night when i should be a little bit busier with cake pickups during the day and early on the weekends maybe some events here and there but they'll be very controlled um, based on how parking is going and how the community is uh bringing the concept so i have a lot of control over when those spaces can get used and what schedule so that's a perfect example you've already investigated that scenario and, and understand uh, the pros and the cons of it and kudos for you for you know moving forward and you know wish you success so this we have to make more opening day <laughs> love to have her answer for you <laughs> <laughs> open day <and> later <laughs> So what we're looking for is a motion to just allocate the four additional parking spaces. We, we yeah, we move in second. We move in second. They heard no second discussion. Okay. All right. So you now we have all the discussion that everybody seems to want to have. Um, all those in favor? Like to say aye. Please do so. Aye. Aye. I'm abstaining that. You're abstaining? Mm -hmm. Keep it with my conscience. All right. Anything else? Just have it. Thank you, folks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Community service. Community service. We're looking looking forward to the new Oh, you're right. Okay. Thank you. Nice to be cheered up. Thank you. We all need a little bit of litter to get through the day. Thank, Thank you all very much for your service. Can I make one side comment on the previous your interview of the uh, administrator? Um, timeliness is huge. Uh, from previously being a DRB chair, not having you know, doc documents of timely manner was really, really frustrating. Uh, and then from an applicant like tonight, <laughs> um, you know. Like, uh, we want to look for a sign permit for business in six months, which is just a permit. That could have taken a week. Uh, it's, it's, sign permits are simple. It, it, 
that sort of <laughs> red bump in your topic of. So that would just that's just an important thing from a, both sides of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Trust me, I see the same side that you're seeing. You know. Yeah, well, I mean, especially for that for board members to be able to have documents to be able to prepare for me. You know. that's, that's so important. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> It's the third side because I have to speak up because I, I working here and seeing what the zoning administrator is doing, it's a really tough job. Mm -hmm. So he gave only two sides. He didn't give the third side. <laughs> the one in the chair. I know that being like the BRB, the I speak yeah. with Tina and so, the, the two previous you know, zoning administrators. That's a tough job. It's a tough job. Job. And it all starts with, I just have one question. Sure. And 25 questions later, no with that said, that's not something that we asked or talked about, but I know that Alyssa is on the call, and I'm curious if we could ask her opinion of based on the interview with Cam. And maybe that wait or not. I don't know. Now it's not. Yeah, so, it's 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 so since it's Jeff and Karen both mentioned, you know, like timeliness being right. just an important factor, but we didn't get to talk with Cam about that. I was wondering if we might ask Alyssa about it, if it came up in the interview and her opinion about that with Cam, or if now's not the time. You mean the time, the, the timing process through the regulations? Oh, how how timely he can yeah. be potentially making decisions and moving things forward. Right. on top of the work and that right. kind of thing. So I, so, I had just, just <clears throat> didn't have an interview with him, but when I met with him yesterday, I did share with him that there has been some frustration, um, both internally and externally, about the past zoning administrator. Um, the, the key is the zoning administrator determining that the application is complete. And that's where the rub sometimes is. Um, and I have had people complain that I came here, I submitted a permit application, and you know, it's weeks have gone by, nothing has happened. By. Then I would talk to Dina, and she would say, Well, I asked them to provide me a copy of X, Y, and Z, and I didn't get it until three days ago, and the application isn't complete until I get it. And then I have 15 days to act on it. Um, so I've had this discussion with Steve. Um, I've had this discussion with the Planning Commission and Steve back when we were a, a year ago when Dina's term uh, came up. There was some concern on the Planning Commission. They wondered whether they should be appointed her because they had some of those issues. And they did reappoint her and then you know, Steve now under this new configuration is formally, uh, not formally passed, but formal. Uh, he's the supervisor of the zoning administrator now. Uh, I did make Steve the administrative supervisor of Dina before, but under the, the law, he really wasn't her supervisor, but I, I tried to help move things along that way. So I did explain to Cam that uh, timeliness is important. I told him that, as you just suggested when you were interviewing him, you know, people who own the property should be given the benefit of the doubt as often as possible. So if they submit an application, try to get it to the point where you can determine it complete as quickly as possible, communicate well and, and quickly with them. If it's, if it's not complete, once it is complete, you know, try to act on a timely basis just because it says 15 days. You don't have to take 15 days. You can do it in five. That's okay, too. Um, so I did have that conversation with him. I also told him that, you know, when there's a gray area, and this is a frustration that I've had with many zoning administrators, not just me, Dina. Um, sometimes I think they get overly protective of the regulations. I said, if it's a gray area, you know, if the law tells them that they have to literally interpret the bylaw. Well, that's kind of oxymoronic, right? <laughs> literally interpret. So you, you've got to make some judgment call. I said, if you really are in a situation where 
It's a toss-up. Well, it could be this, it could be that. I said, issue the permit. Give the benefit of the doubt for the person who owns the property, who's paying the taxes, who wants to develop their property, and let the neighbors be the one that appeals your decision. Don't say no, it might offend the neighbors, and then make the, the person who's trying to get the permit appeal, it's his property, you know, give it to him. So I did have that conversation. So to that point, should there be some form of documentation by the zoning administrator, as we are now calling him, um, to kind of cover their butt so that they're not in the hot seat when there is a gray area that yeah. they have to make a you know a knee jerk. Well, of course, there's uh, um, there's always going to be documentation. Well, but Chris, there are things that say you will not, and th those are documented. Sometimes in the regulation it says should not. Should gives you flexibility. And um with Bill is where it says should gives you some leeway. And I err upon you know doing something versus where it says you can't, it says you will not do this, you don't have a choice. Well we have we instituted it with Dina, but then I'm sure Steve will continue this with whomever, whether it's Cameron or someone else. You know, uh, permit application comes in, it gets logged in with a date, and then, you know, there should be another notation that is complete as of such and such a date, right. and the clock starts ticking. Um, you know, we had a situation a few, well, it's probably several months ago, if not longer, where <clears throat> Dina had a permit, and when she was away on vacation and Steve was the acting zoning administrator. He actually issued a permit because he felt that the time had expired. And the, the law says if the permit's complete and the zoning administrator doesn't take action within a certain period of time, the permit is in fact a issue. So uh, we try not to let that happen. Yeah, that's I think I think some of the most cumbersome parts of the process is the appeal periods, you know. Yeah, that frustrates people. A lot of starts ticking the minute you make your decision. But I think the, the key is, is to be good at documenting what you're doing. And, you know, I think, and I'll have this conversation with Steve and whoever the, the new person is, um, you know, you, you can be proactive. If it says, um, the permit has to be issued 15 days after the application is deemed complete. Well, if if 10 days goes by and the application isn't still complete, you can write a letter to the applicant and say, look, the application isn't complete yet. It's 10 days old. I don't have to issue it within five days because you haven't done something. And I think sometimes and it's it, time management is a challenge. And Especially, you know, 2020 was a tough year because there were a lot of people sitting at home with nothing to do and everybody wanted to develop something, build something, that. decks, <laughs> sheds. Yeah. And, you know, you got one person. And now the structure that we have now, we have two people that will be able to, to act on these things. Uh, so uh, it, it is a little bit of a challenge, but, you know, I think we're aware of those concerns and We'll do our best to try to address Before we go into executive session, whether it's now or later, I would like to hear from Melissa, knowing that none of us watched the interview, if that's, and I think she's important. Can talk to her, right? Yeah, yeah. Have to be in session. Before is what I meant. So whether it's now or yeah, yeah, I don't know things. that she needs to or wants to stick around. Right. She's <laughs> in the meeting, so maybe Perfect. you have to talk to her now, and she'd probably do that. Just any input, Alyssa, you might have after your interview before we, you know, deliberate together as a as a board. Yeah, I guess I would say upfront, I want to be mindful, like we didn't discuss as a planning commission providing input, but obviously given that it pertains to everyone and that I'm here, you know, I'm happy to share. I would also just say um Personally, and as someone now in the planning commission role, this is a great select board meeting to be listening in on. I appreciate that the parking was also at this meeting, some um, good common threads. 
Um, in terms of your question about timeliness and management of systems, I would say that was a question we asked. Um, in addition to what Jeffrey alluded to with the Development Review Board receiving materials, we as the Planning Commission also receive materials. Obviously, Steve prepares some of those, but we also get like zoning administrator reports talking about the status of permits and what happens and you know, ostensibly that informs our work as the people, you know, creating the direction that a zoning administrator is administering. Um, so certainly planning commission members who have been around longer than I feel like getting that information and having it be timely and complete um, is important to our work. So that was a question that was asked during the interview process and part of our consideration. And I guess this is more my own um, spin on things, but I would just say that another piece of timeliness is having someone in the position. And I guess just like making the link to parking is, I feel like we have a ton of stuff we could do as the planning commission. We're excited about it. I know we had our first time, we didn't have a quorum yesterday, but that being said, you know, there's the zoning rewrite that everyone's sick of hearing about and administrative updates and do we think about, you know, would the zoning rewrite enable some of this joint conversation with you all around parking or Act 250 and um, having staff support helps us move that forward. So I think I would just say, like, I think it's generally in the interest of the Planning Commission to have a full planning and zoning department. Um, you know, we recognize there will be training needed and that, um, you know, day one, we wouldn't expect anyone to be able to be fully up to speed. But I think, um, you know, I think if we're allowed to say candidly, we, ha we had folks withdraw because they took employment elsewhere. And just given the hiring environment, again, just speaking for myself, um, you know, this is kind of an unusual hiring process, as you all know, and Bill has outlined, again, this is my own editorializing, I just want to be clear. But, um, you know, the points that are just made of like, they interview with us, then there's this weird in between, they interview with you. Um, just to say, I have a personal concern about timeliness of um, not finding someone. But the bottom line answer to your question is we nominated Cam because we thought he could do the job. We think it's important to have someone in the job. And we did ask a question about timeliness because it's of interest to us. Yeah, I think following up on that, um, and you can ask us some more questions if you want. Um, there were a number of good candidates in the end, Cam is the only candidate. There were several uh, that withdrew for other reasons. And I, I was not at the Planning Commission meeting, and Alyssa, I think she just alluded to it. But I asked Steve, I said, okay, he's the only candidate. Um, was he a good candidate, or is he the only candidate? Because there's a difference. And, and um, I guess the Planning Commission probably talk about that a little bit, but the Planning Commission's decision was, we don't think it's in our best interest to re-advertise, even though he's the only candidate right now, because we believe he can do the job. And I, I'll ask you if that's more or less what ended up happening. Yes, I think that echoes our sentiments. Do we even need to have a second session? I did. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Alyssa. And I'm excited. Oops. There goes my <laughs> I'm excited for future conversations about parking and other fun things. So just say I <laughs> that's an age-old problem. <laughs> all right. Thanks all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna move on. Okay. Okay, so this meeting was some time ago, so I do have some updates to my notes. Um, the last meeting I attended, uh, it, was, it was very intense um, for a couple of reasons. So if you've read my previous notes, there's been some discussion on the water tower and the amount of water that it leaks. Um, and the rink staff and the rink board of directors discussed replacing it um, this year, but at the length of time it would take to get the parts off here, it would take six to eight weeks and I would push back programs they already had in place for scheduling and push back against hockey season. So they decided to put it off. But I talked to Timmy last night because I was there for a different board meeting and they have received some of the parts, um, but they're not going to be installing it 
soon. The other issue that was brought up was a mold issue. Um, I was in a hockey league this summer and coaching a league this summer. And we have gear in the dry room, which is in between uh, locker rooms two and three. That's where the high school kids keep their gear. I realized that some of the gear wasn't dry from a week prior. So I asked Timmy about it. He went and looked at some of the um, systems and said they were reading fine with humidity, but it turns out it was a faulty, it was an error in the reading system. Um, so I had that looked at. I have it in my notes here um, about when it was last replaced and the life expectancy for the Munter system. Um, so like I said, there was really high tension at the last meeting because they didn't know if they'd have to shut down to eradicate the mold and just how much of it was there. There were some behind the lockers, um, additionally to the dry rooms, the lockers on the outside, um, and how, just how bad it, the mold was. Um, so they ended up talking to me, they ended up canceling some of the programming. They went to different rinks because of the mold issue. They had got it checked out. Um, and by one opinion, they said it was okay. They got a second opinion. It, they got the same result that it wasn't too terrible. So um, they talked about different options at that meeting of what they could do to go forward and try to get it fixed. So in my notes, it talks about um, exploring dehumidifier options um, and their cleaning process. What work has to be done, what has to be removed, cleaned, come down, dry roll removal and um, replacement of indoor lockers and benches. So that is outlined. And they also had to speak with their insurance company about what would be covered, uh, loss of business, things like that. And talking with Timmy last night, um, that was still a discussion with the insurance company of what would be covered. There are programs still happening in the ice rink right now. Um, and they are still going forward with their future scheduling. But the, like I said, the, the system has been, the monitors has been replaced. Um, but yeah, they're still looking at cleaning. That is that. More and more financial pressure. <clears throat> and it's just free. That's a consequence of aging building. Yep, and if you have any questions um, that you want to ask, just let me know and I can forward them down to Timmy and that board as well. Thank you, Katie. Yep. Okay, which one are we at? The uh, commission is right. So, um, the select board is not only aware of the demise of uh, untimely death of Jack Carter uh, back at the beginning of the summer. Uh, Jack was also a cemetery commission, uh, and his term runs through 2024. So, he was elected as cemetery commissioner in 2019. And he's passed away. So the uh, cemetery commissioners, they uh, at their last meeting, they asked me to um, inform the select board that Jack had passed, and that they would like to uh, advertise for someone to be appointed to the position. So again, for the benefit of the new select board members, when an elected official of the town. Uh, either resigns or passes away or for whatever reason cannot fulfill uh, their term uh, uh, and their uh, a vacancy arises, the select board gets to appoint the uh, fill the vacancy until the next annual meeting. So what the commissioners would like you to do now is advertise for someone interested in serving as a cemetery commissioner. Um, at your next meeting or a subsequent meeting from tonight anyway, uh, you'll make that appointment. You'll appoint that person to fill the vacancy until the next annual meeting, which is March 2022. And in March 2022, there'll be one cemetery commissioner whose term is up that year, will be running for election. So it'll be a five-year term. And then for this, whoever gets appointed to this, uh, slot will be appointed for 
the uh, remaining term that expires in 2024. So it will be two years from, from March. So that cemetery commissioner, they would like you to uh, move forward with that process. Uh, on the library commission yesterday, the library commissioners met Curtis Osler, who was also elected in 2019, I believe, uh, and his term expires in 2024 as well. Curtis has submitted effective today his resignation. Uh, it's been my pleasure to serve on the Library Library Commission for the past few years. It's been an honor to work with you all because of the change in career and resulting relocation out of state. I hereby submit my resignation effective today, Tuesday, September 14th. It's with mixed feelings that I do so. I wish you the best and for our new library director and for the library long into the future. So Curtis is uh, has resigned effective today. So same process. So uh, what we'll do is we'll advertise for those two positions and then hopefully sometime in the next couple of weeks bring some candidates to you. Well, yep. We um, advertise for both the library and cemetery director's position. Yeah. Yep. Second. Uh, who say I? Right. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think that's a court case. Yeah, this is pretty pro forma. Um, if you remember Perry Hill Partners, that's the new building on Stowe Street where the people food is going to go and those medical offices and other offices on the second, third floors. Um, they um, they were denied a zoning permit by the DRB. Uh, they subsequently appealed that uh, decision and the select board began the process of adopting into a zoning. So, uh, this is a stipulation to withdraw. It comes from the Perry Hill Partners. Uh, it's been submitted to court, and uh, our lawyer has forwarded it to me and uh, has asked uh, if the town has a, an opinion on it. So it basically says now comes Perry Hill Partners through their attorneys uh, uh, hereby moves to withdraw its appeal from court for the reasons stated herein. While we select board adopted in terms of zoning bylaws on April 26, the appellant the applied for zoning permit. The development review board approved the appellant's permit application on July 21st, 2021. For, the fall, for those foregoing reasons, the issues raised in the appellant's appeal to this court uh, have now been resolved. So it's a formality. So if you can make a motion to agree to the stipulation to withdraw or to withdraw this appeal, that would be appreciated. So second. Any further questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Manager's items. Okay. Um we uh as you know, I, I said, do you have a point voting delegate under select board item? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I do that. Sorry. That's why I thought you were just talking. Yeah. That's the one I didn't get. We got the alphabet got away from us. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. so, the law of cities and towns is the municipal association, the municipal league that the town belongs to. Uh, they are our advocates before the legislature. They provide numerous training opportunities for public officials, both elected and appointed. Uh, they run three different insurance, uh, well, two insurance trusts covering three different types of insurance, uh, property and casualty, health insurance, and unemployment insurance. They don't really do much with health insurance anymore because of the Affordable Care Act that was adopted under President Obama's administration. Anyway, they have their annual meeting in the fall, usually in October this year. It is September 29th, and then the remaining next week, um, 
September 29th will be an in-person uh, annual meeting, basically. It will be also conducted by Zoom. Uh, the three uh, ELCT boards had their annual meeting that day. The, 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 the general board, the board of directors of the cities and town, where a municipal legislative policy will be discussed, debated, and hopefully approved. And then the, uh, the two insurance trusts will have their annual meetings. And uh, there is a requirement for member towns who would like to participate and vote to appoint a voting delegate, one from each town. It's not like by population. So a uh, little victory gets as many votes as they throw. When it comes to, uh, I like it. When it comes to the, the, the legislature, can't do that anymore. But, yeah. uh, anyway, so um, the select board can appoint anyone, uh, should be an elected or appointed official. Sir, if anyone of you would like to be the voting delegate, I think you'll do a great job, Bill. Uh, and if that's the board's choice, I'll be happy to act on behalf of the board. Isn't the meeting? I know there's only like one day that's. Yeah, there's only person. one in person meeting, and then there's several trainings virtual. Uh, virtual. And if any one of you want to attend any of those, go ahead and sign up or let me know when I can sign you up. It's, it's really good. I've been to a number of the trainings. Yeah, found a couple on the calendar. They're, they're quite good. It just came to me. I probably, I, I wish I could have went to the in person one, but I'm going to be out of town that, that day. The virtual ones, I don't, I don't know, might want to attend a couple of days. Yeah, if, and if you do, um, I, I believe there is a fee. If you right, want to attend small those. fee. Um, if you know for sure you want to do it, you can uh, let me know and I'll register you and we'll pay for you to, you know, directly. If you're not sure and you decide at the last minute that you want to attend, you can go ahead and you know, use your credit card, and pay the fee, and then submit the reimbursement. So that's available. Yeah. And in the future, you know, this is the second year in a row due to COVID that they really have not had the, been able to have the, the normal town fair. Last year was all virtual. Uh, even the annual meetings were all virtual. But in a future year, if COVID ever gets out of the way and uh, you're able to attend, it's usually it's a, it's a day and a half like uh, usually alternates between Burlington and yeah. Killington. And uh, it's it's uh, something that I would recommend to all of you okay. if you can at some yeah, point. Okay. Time. Okay. Okay. Well, well, well. Anyway, so if you said, are you making a motion? I make a motion to to uh, appoint Bill as our delegate to the Mount League season, season camps uh, meeting, annual meeting. Second. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. So, what are the, some of the topics that they would cover? Please can just go on their website. It's pretty easy. To do that. Well, there's, you know, the legislative policy. Uh, they used to do it every year. They're doing it every two years now. I can't remember if this is the on year or the off year, but they'll make some tweaks. Right. But typically, they have. Um, I think they have four sections. They have a finance and administration into governmental relations committee, called fair committee. They have a quality of life committee. They have a public safety committee, and there's one that's more uh, into environmental stuff. Uh, yeah, public public work, work, people, and like that. and, and um, you know they solicit elected officials and, and appointed officials to be members of those committees. Those committees craft and edit the, the, the policies that ultimately get voted on by the delegates at the town fair. And then that adopted policy becomes their platform. And you know, that they use that in the legislature to try to push forward the municipality's agenda before the legislature. Most of the time, unfortunately, it's like the legislation that you're talking about approving is not in compliance with our policy. Please don't approve it. 
once in a while you get there and I would say, hey, we think that what you're doing is good and we want, it's often used to say, pull the reins and. They actually last year did a very good job considering it was all virtual, you know. I'm one I just like in person mm -hmm. and kind of meeting, but you know, some things you can do virtually pretty well. And yeah. Their staff does, as a matter of fact, that and the uh, town offices, and, what is it, TOEC, with town offices, town officials, and employees, committee, good set ball. TLC thing, I would interest <laughs> extension does that. And I would, oh, that, yeah, I would encourage anyone of you to attend that as well. Did that this point. Okay. So based on that, um, all those in favor of having Bill be in the voting delegate for DLC Key Town Fair, say aye. 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 Yes. No more on the hand here, but. Okay, um, contract renewal with land records spent. This is uh, this is from Carla's shop, and she's not able to be with us tonight. Um, anyway, uh, we have had a, an agreement with Avenue Enterprise Solutions for a number of years. I think we've had two five year contracts with them already. They do, uh, we have Fund 36, which is uh, a restoration of records. Uh, fund and when people come in and they pay for recording, there's a certain amount of money that goes into this restoration of records fund. And this company uh, does a, uh, a lot of work with our land records, making them accessible to the public. Carla had gone out and looked for another uh, vendor this year to deal with these land record uh, restorations and making them accessible through the website. You know, you can look at all the land records or most of the land records through the website. And uh, several months ago, Carla came to the select board and asked you to approve uh, signing a contract with a company called Profile, and you approved that contract. And uh, when the and the contract starts in September, so the the, old, the current contract with this avenue ends uh, well, at the end of September. Uh, September twenty second is when the new contract will be in effect. So, so, so Carla had gone out solicited proposals and decided that she wanted to go with a new company, Cofile. They were supposed to start September 22nd, 2021, and Avenue where it kind of winding down. Uh, Carla sent me this email um, last week and said, there'll be an agenda item under manager's items that is the contract renewal with land records vendor. At a previous meeting, the board approved me signing a new contract with Cofile. After signing the contract, I learned that Cofile has stopped selling and servicing the system. Uh, he, and she said, you know, so she contacted Cofile and said, what do you mean you're not, you know, I just signed a contract with you and now you're not going to sell this product anymore. Oh, that's all right. We'll make sure we take care of you. And she said, well, how many other customers do you have? And she got into it with them and she said, look, I'm not comfortable going with a company that's not going to have this product anymore. You can tell me all you want that you're going to service me, but if something goes wrong, where am I then? I'm going to promise. You. So anyway, she has worked out with them. They've agreed to allow her to cancel the contract. So what Carol would like to do is ask you to approve the uh, contract from the current vendor, Avenue. Uh, it's essentially the same price as it was before. Um, she told me earlier today that it used to be a per document price and now they switched it to uh, $1,060 a month. But she said, if you look at the number of documents, it's within, you know, pennies. So I would recommend that you just authorize Carolyn to sign this uh, contract. 
contract with Evelyn to provide solutions for the uh, health waters land record uh, management system. I move to uh, have the town clerk engage with what's the name of the company? Avenue. Avenue. Solution. Okay. Um, uh, to engage with Avenue uh, to do uh, the town land records for. Any questions? None. All those in favor? Say aye. Aye. Thank you. Update on 2021 paving. Let me get this back to you. So you can do that. The paving season. Well, we did get this goes through that. Um, yeah. We had decided earlier in the year, even if we got the Stowe Street plant, we won't get a paved Stowe Street this year because of. You know the, the money we didn't know early enough uh, that we were going to get it. So I had come to the board and we shifted gears and we've got Blush Hill. But yeah, we did get the Snow Street paving grant and uh, we will have to take that uh, really in by, uh, July next year. So we know Snow Street will be in that paving. Um, Portfolio for next year, if you will. Uh, and speaking of Stowe Street, uh, again, for Danny's benefit more than anybody, Katie, you might remember some of this conversation. We signed an agreement with the state probably six years ago now to, to have the state come in and do a sign package and a pavement parking package to calm traffic both on Stowe Street and Duffel Road. And I don't know what has happened, but they have they've not done anything that they were supposed to do under that contract. So now that we have the state grant for those street paving, I will make sure the water works with the name is Mario, I think, uh, and to make sure that once we're done paving, that the, the line striping and the marking and the signage that We've already, the state's already committed to do, gets done. That would be the best time to do it. Um, it's right after that it's paid. So I'll, I'll Was that contract that's been ongoing or it was a one time sign in the marketing? Yeah, it was a one time uh, deal. What I don't understand, and I've never got a straight answer, is how come we entered into this agreement if we never did what we said we were going to do? And there was a lot of back and forth, and it's like, well, it's really better to do it like, you know, after you've done a paving project, they didn't represent that when they mm -hmm. decided. But I'll work with Bill and we'll work on that. Anyway, um, our 2021 paving is just about done. Um, we used 2021 money uh, along with a little bit of Main Street money. so. Elm Street, which was really in bad shape, uh, and you know, going back to 2018, November of 18, if you think back that far, uh, the village went in and replaced the sewer line there in advance of the Main Street project because that pipe needed to be bigger, uh, stronger, and work needed to be done there. So the village did their work on the sewer and storm drain on Elm Street that was outside the limits of the, of the Main Street project. They put temporary pavement back in, but you know, it, kind of, it was pretty beat up. So Elm Street has been paved. Uh, it's, it's, the water runs where it's supposed to run. Uh, it's a thousand times better than it was. It's not the ideal system, but it, it's much, much improved over where it was. We also uh, refund last fall, uh, the fall of 2020, we placed the water line on Stowe Street from Main Street up to the dry bridge. Uh, that was again outside the Main Street project. It was not included in the Main Street project. 
Uh, and then this year, earlier this year, they did the sewer line from Main Street up to the dry bridge and um, worked out with the EFUD and the town's budget. So now Stowe Street is fully paid. So uh, EFUD did all the subterranean work and essentially paid, paid for that project to bring everything back up to grade and attached and then the town put the top coat on because that road was needed to so, you know, be brought up to speed. We didn't want it working like a sore thumb with Main Street Drive. So Stowe Street has been built to the brand new standards of Main Street. We also replaced the uh, the membrane on the dry bridge. And so we took that right down to the concrete deck, put a new rubber mem membrane on that, and then we paved the dry bridge. So from the dry bridge, from the uh, Union Street, Railroad Street at the side of the dry bridge, over the dry bridge, all the way to Main Street, that, that's all done. Obviously, Main Street is 99% done. They've got a little punch list items that they're working on now, but that job is pretty much done except for the removal of the power poles between the congregational church and the state uh, complex. Um, that work is ongoing. Uh, we're hopeful that maybe by this time next year, most of those poles will be down. That's what we're pushing for, but neither us nor Jay McDonald nor the state are really in control of that. That's Fremont Power, Comcast, Fairpoint, and a couple of other smaller utility companies. Are any coming down this season yet? Um, I don't think any have come down yet. Um, Remount Power has moved almost all of their lines, and Comcast has done a pretty decent job of moving most of their stuff. Consolidated, which used to be Fairphone, which used to be Bloomberg Telephone, which used to be AT&T. Uh, Consolidated is the, the one that you go and pick in the bottom all the time. Um, so anyway, that's done. Lush Hill and Lonesome Trail, that's where we decided to put the bulk of our money this year. So from the end of the class two project, which is a little ways above Kennedy Drive, where we had the class two pavement from uh, two years ago, I think, four years ago. We milled off, uh, took off all the pavement, all the way up to the end of the pavement of Lush Hill. Um, Incorporated that uh, those grindings into the base, added uh, chloride and, and some gravel that we needed to, um, and we have put a base coat on all of that. Now. now we had talked about once we get past Lonesome Trail, where we have to do the big culvert job uh, in the dip, uh, just before you get to Wendell Lowe's house on the right. Uh, we had talked about leaving that unpaved this year. Uh, Bill Woodruff came back to me last week and said, well, we've got some concerns about, um, you know, how well we'll be able to keep that in the winter. Um, he, he recommended that we put a base coat on that. So Lush Hill has a base coat all the way to the end. Um, the top coat will go on Blush Hill uh, next week, I believe, is the schedule. Uh, and the top coat will go from where the project started at the bottom to just beyond Lonesome Trail. And then we'll leave the rest of it just base coat. We'll have to come back next year and cut out a little bit of pavement where we're going to replace that culvert. Um, that's what I thought we were going to avoid if we hadn't done it, but uh, Woody and Alec had talked about it. They felt it was best if we put a base coat there. Lonesome Trail, um, we also did Lonesome Trail. And if you remember, you agreed to allow us to uh, pave the portion of Lonesome Trail that wasn't paved. So our full road on Lonesome Trail is paved now. That just got an overlay. We did not grind that all out. Um, 
and as you know better than most, Chris, uh, you know, you put pavement on the gravel road, the road looks different. You know, there's some of the shoulders need some work now in terms of uh, the elevation of the shoulders versus the road and the building on the road. So right at the end there, just past the golf course where the, the old pavement ended, was there any sub work done on the road itself before they paved it or did they just read it and pay it? Yeah, I um, I'm not positive. I, I think they I think they graded it out. I think they probably added some. I, I don't know for sure for certain. But um, anyway, we're almost finished. I don't have the bills yet, so I don't have much of well, by putting an entire base coat on and then paving, was that, was the whole paving cost of the paving project for the entire brush hill, was that in this budget or will we have to make up? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think we'll, because we didn't do so Street at all, except for the main, you know, the portion near the driveway to the main street, I believe we'll be within our budgets. Um, if it went over, it's not going to be extraordinarily over. Okay. Yep. All right. I think that's the last thing on the agenda list. Uh, if that is, we can make a motion to go into executive session. Off about the uh, assistant planning and zoning director. Karen, just to confirm, since we didn't review the entertainment ordinance, did you or can you move it back into the parking lot on the Oh, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Just an FYI for all of you, just, just a few acres big. Um, the Central Vermont uh, State Police uh, Advisory Board, which I'm member of, uh, they're going to have a picnic for the troopers, uh, for all the troopers in the, in the district on the 22nd of the Waterbury Cell Fishing Game Club. You're more than welcome to, to attend. Okay. I believe it's a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. during the middle of the day. You want to picnic, you know, for the troopers, that's why it's not on a weekend, mm -hmm. stuff like that. There's one more course of business for me. It's gone back and forth and we finally, well, we finally got it done with, it was hard with the uh, state police, you know, schedule. You know, it was originally scheduled for the 22nd, then it was based upon there, and they they just um, agreed to that. So if anyone just wants to even just pop in and say hi, thanks for what they do, you're more than welcome to. Make a note. So Mike, do you want to make a motion seeing how you requested the uh, executive session? So moved. Okay. Second. All right. Okay. So, so we'll take it. Right. Um,